Afro-American, uh, like the Afro-West Indian, is uh, one of the immigrants uh, to the country. And from that point of view, the land, though stolen, is also partly his. But from another point of view, he is a minority anyway. And this alters the experience when you're a minority, and so on. Uh, in the Caribbean, for instance, there was more evidence of negritude in Haiti, for instance, and outside of the Francophone area in Cuba, and to a much lesser degree, a very much lesser degree in, uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, how, therefore, does one explain uh, this spillover from the Francophone Caribbean to the Hispanic Caribbean? Uh, that the explanation for that is a much larger one. For instance, the degree of nationalism, for instance, in Hispanic, the Hispanic Caribbean is quite different in scale and much earlier in time than obtained in, Anglo in the Anglophone Caribbean. So that the whole uh, phenomenon of political consciousness <coughs> and, uh, and identity is different in, Hispanic, in the Hispanic Caribbean from Anglophone Caribbean. I'm suggesting, therefore, that when one considers what I would insist is a continuous tradition of protest, black protest writing, that embraces the, the, the total black experience. When one considers this, then it is necessary to bear in mind that the circumstances differ. Thus, it helps to explain the peculiar emergence of negritude in Anglophone East Africa at a time when one might have confidently pronounced that the phase of negritude <coughs> had passed. I'm thinking here in particular of Okot Pibitek's Song of Lawino. And I confess that I skipped some of the examples I wanted to read because I wanted to make sure that there was time enough to um, read a little of Lawino for those of you who, have, um, who, who don't know the poem. Uh, Lawino, the song of Lawino is a lament by the wife, Lawino. A lament which is necessitated, first of all, and it's always best to acknowledge this truth, because her husband, Ochol, has deserted her. Not territorially, he's still there in the same house with her and so on. It's the best way to desert your wife, really, to make sure that you maintain a presence, a physical presence. Uh, but he has uh, another uh, woman. And uh, so that part of the energy of the poem comes from the aggrieved wife. Hell hath no fury and all that kind of thing. Uh, but it's also a poem, it's also a lament uh, on a larger scale because Lawino is also indicting her husband of having rejected the traditional ways of his people and having assumed the um, style of life of the European. So that the woman whom he has is not only another woman, but it's another woman who is also westernized, as I shall try to show from one or two excerpts. Indeed, the name, the name Ochal itself means black man. So that uh, when in Song of Lawino, Lawino is lamenting Ochal's abandonment of his culture, uh, the poem becomes uh, emblematic of the westernizing uh, process that threatens to engulf uh, much of Africa in the urbanization trend. 
What is important is that it is a lament. It's a song, as the title says. And in the song, as Lawino pours out her soul, her aggrieved soul, she not only accuses him of not observing his culture, but she manages to identify and delineate that culture in, the, in her lament without the result sounding contrived. It's really a, 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 a feat of Pibitex that he can make Lawino in lamenting about her husband's um, um, defection, he can make her retail samples of uh, the culture, the abandoned culture, without making the thing seem contrived. And that is very important because both the medium of song and the delineation of cultural uh, aspects of, of, of life mean that Okot Pibitek is not stridently proclaiming his negritude, but is allowing the poem itself to be evidence of negritude. In other words, Okot Pibitek manages to do what Wole Shoenka had been calling on the negritude writers to do for a long time. That is to say, let the fact of your negritude emerge from the nature of your art, from the subject matter, from the treatment, from the form, and so forth, rather than uh, standing on the rooftop and proclaiming, I am African, I am a Negro, I have negritude. Shoenka's point of view is, if you're a Negro, you must have negritude. Now let me see it. <laughs> uh, and there's a, there's a sense in which Shoenka's work uh, sometimes reflects this negritude without the, what I would dare to call, in the presence of some of my colleagues here, what I would dare to call the typical French rhetorical declamat uh, declamatory uh, attitude to things. So that Song of Lewino is negritude, but it is not the strident negritude that we have come to know in the poems, in some of the poems, to be fair to them, in some of the poems of Sango, or uh, Leon Dama, or the Diop brothers, or Roussan Camille, and so on. Uh, it is instead a poem that is expressive of, expressive of negritude, a poem that dramatizes the anguish that is the result of the westernization of Ochal, the westernization of the uh, black man. Now, I want to read just one or two. One can, when one starts reading some of Lorino, one, one is difficult to put it down. Uh, I would. Uh, Therefore, limit myself just to a couple examples. Uh, this one, the first one I will read is called, Describes the Woman with Whom I Share My Husband. A a an important point to remember here is that uh, Song of Lawino was at first written in Acholi, uh, Pibitek's um, indigenous language, and then translated into English. And in addition to what I've said about the, the medium of song, and so on, there are other aspects of traditional oral uh, song and literature that appear in the novel. For instance, the, all the metaphoric references, uh, <coughs> uh, all the furniture of the poem are in terms of the experience, the immediate experience and environment of Lawino. It is not a poem in which you will get what we might call literary uh, uh, metaphors, not very many of them at all. It is a poem that operates very much like 
a, a song by Lawino out in the country should operate. Its references are to the familiar environment and the, the immediate experience of the, the, the girl and of her listeners, which is an understandable feature, a necessary feature of traditional literature. The woman with whom I share my husband. Forgive me, brother. Do not think I'm insulting the woman with whom I share my husband. Do not think my tongue is being sharpened by jealousy. Huh. Well, we know better than that. Uh, it is the sight of Tina that provokes sympathy from my heart. The woman with whom she shares a husband is called Clementina. Clementine. Clementina. I do not deny I'm a little jealous. It is no good lying. We all suffer from a little jealousy. It catches you unawares like the ghosts that bring fevers. It surprises people like earth tremors. But when you see the beautiful woman with whom I share my husband, you feel a little pity for her. Her breasts are completely shriveled up. They are all folded dry skins. They have made nests of cotton wool and she folds the bits of cowhide in the nests and calls them breasts. Oh, my clansmen, how aged modern women pretend to be young girls. They mold the tips of the cotton nests so that they are sharp. And with these, they prick the chests of their men. And the men believe they are holding the waists of young girls that have just shut up. The modern types sleep with their nests tied firmly on their chests. How many kids has this woman sucked? The empty bags on her chest are completely flattened, dried. Perhaps she has aborted many. Perhaps she has thrown her twins in the pit latrine. Is it the vengeance ghosts of the many smashed eggs that have captured her head? How young is this age mate of my mother? You get the real venom <laughs> of an aggrieved wife there, you know? <laughs> the woman with whom I share my husband walks as if her shadow has been captured. You can never hear her footsteps. She looks as if she has been ill for a long time. Actually, she is starving. She does not eat. She says she fears getting fat, that the doctor has prevented her from eating. She says a beautiful woman must be slim, like a white woman. And when she walks, you hear her bones rattling. <laughs> her waist resembles that of the hornet. The beautiful one is dead dry like a stump. She is meatless like a shell on a dry river bed. And in that excerpt, uh, the important thing is that the values against which Lawino is measuring uh, Clementina are values, uh, are norms within the traditional life. When she says her waist is like a hornet, you know, almost every young lady in this would jump up and say, what's wrong with that? Uh, but of course, uh, many Africans, not all by any means, but many Africans, many African communities like to see their women plump and healthy and so on. So that it's, it's these values that are there all the time, silently um, providing the, the means of measuring um, Clementina. Uh, well, let me just um, read one more. And this one is on the mystery of creation. She has been exposed to things like Sunday school and so forth. Right. <coughs> we recited the faith of the messengers like the yellow birds in the Lajanawara grass. The teacher shouted as if half mad and we shouted back. I accept the hunchback, the padre who is very strong, molder of skyland and earth. You see, she, part of the technique, of course, is to put this in the conceptualization of Lawino. My mother was a well-known potter. She molded large pots, vegetable pots, and beautiful long-necked jars. She made water pots and smoking pipes and vegetable dishes and large earthen vessels for bath. She dug the clay from the mouth of the Oitino River. The place was well known among potters. I heard about it when I was a small girl, and when my breasts emerged, I went with my mother and helped her carrying the clay. The hunchback, where did he dig the clay for molding things? 
Where is the pot he dug the clay for molding skyland and the clay for molding earth from the mouth of which river? When my mother has brought the clay from the river, she leaves it to season overnight. The next day she beats it with a wooden hammer and then she molds the pots and dishes and none of her works crack when fired. When Skyland was not yet there and earth was not yet molded, nor the stars, nor the moon, when there was nothing, where did the hunchback live? Where did the hunchback dig the clay for molding things, the clay for molding Skyland, the clay for molding earth, the clay for molding moon, the clay for molding the stars? Where is the spot where it was dug? On the mouth of which river? And when the hunchback was digging the clay, where did he stand? And when he brought home the clay for molding things, where did he put the clay to season overnight? And when he was beating it with a wooden hammer, on which rock did the hunchback put the clay? And thus she expresses her mystification uh, about uh, the creation. Now, it is because Protest, black protest literature is really one continuum that we can understand why it takes the form that it does in East Africa. The negritude writers themselves had been not a little influenced by people like Alain Locke, uh, Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, and so on because the negr negritude itself began in Paris. And Sango and Césaire and one or two others, Tyrolean, uh, later on, Dama, met the Harlem Renaissance writers who were at that time quartered in Paris, met also the Haitian writers who were quartered in Paris and were infected to an enormous degree by the revelations of a literature they had known very little about, which came at a time when they themselves were beginning to react against the scholarly discovery of African art and African culture and so on. And suddenly, therefore, they began to develop this identity of themselves. And the best poem poems in which to see this revulsion from the assimilated black Frenchman, the best poems in which to see this revulsion in the row would be, in my view, the poems of Léon Dama. He is the, one, he is the poet who really expresses that revulsion most strongly. Uh, the South African writers, in turn, had themselves been exposed to uh, the Harlem Renaissance and the negritude, negritudinists. The point I am making is uh, once writers are conscious of this tradition of protest literature, uh, they are not likely to uh, go through the same phases and the same motions which have already been played out in the literature. They are themselves uh, re-evaluating the literature of protest and trying to extract from it those aspects which help them to see their own situation better. I think, in fact, it is in the light of this kind of continuity that one can understand better even certain recent, <coughs> more recent, uh, expressions of protest in the United States itself. Uh, Ellison's The Invisible Man is sometimes easily <coughs> explained away as a non-racial novel, uh, a novel that abjures uh, race protest and is simply a universal uh, you know, kind of experience. In point of fact, if one understands that as time goes on and as the circumstances change, the, the, the stance of the protest writer also changes with it, 
one can better see how uh, the Invisible Man is first of all race protest and then after that uh, universal uh, work. And, and which is the right order, the point in which I wish to close in a minute. Uh, similarly, uh, that sense of continuity and of development uh, would explain another protest work, say like Sam Greenlee's The Spook Who Sat By The Door. The point is that literature, as I think George Eliot once said of art, all art, she said, begins by being provincial. And in a very real sense, this is true. Uh, she might have been trying to uh, defend things like Middlemarch <laughs> or, or Adam Bede or Silas Manor. But uh, in, another in that sense, it is also true. But there is another sense in which it is even truer that the, the artist, and particularly the writer, relates to the experience which is closest to him, which is deepest in his bones. Uh, that need not be, of course, uh, his village. In, in some cases, it takes, a different, it takes a different form. It might even be more distant. But certainly, there is no experience that can be deeper in the bones of a black man in North America, in particular in South Africa, and also in the colonized parts of the African diaspora. There is no experience that can be deeper in his bones than the experience of prejudice in one form or another. More extreme, obviously, in South Africa than anywhere else. More extreme in North America than in the Caribbean. But the subtle forms of it are fully uh, appreciated in places where it is not as extreme as elsewhere. But in dealing with that experience of oppression, he is, the black man is reacting as a human being. And therefore, the nature of his response must of necessity speak to all human beings so that there's that level on which the work becomes universal. The invisible man can become universal while still remaining uh, a novel about uh, black experience. Uh, and indeed, any of these poems, if they're good, that qualification must always be made if they're good. If they're good poems, they also, while speaking about the most intense personal experience, is in fact speaking about you and me. Is speaking about a human reaction to suffering anywhere. And so, when the writer, because first of all I'm speaking about the experience of the man as a man, when the writer, in turn, comes to treat of this experience, and at the same time wants to be a voice of protest on behalf of his people, but also a writer, and therefore necessarily having to respect certain canons of the art, it becomes a very interesting situation for the student of literature. How can the black writer, and by extension any writer in a similar position, be at once the voice of propaganda, so to speak, for his people? How can he respond to the urge and need for commitment, and at the same time transmute that into art? I submit that the process whereby those who succeed do it become in itself a matter of interest for students of literature beyond the aesthetic aspect of the matter. There is the further exploration which it provides of the human spirit struggling to express itself 
in circumstances that seem to defy that expression. My final point is that while that in itself is as worthy as any other kind of literature for study, the perhaps the most important point is that the ex that experience of human suffering and the human resilience that meets it should be brought at all levels of our educational curricula before our students so that they, generation after generation, come to understand what kind of bestialities man is capable of, but how in turn man is equally capable of rising above these. How the experience of an oppressed people can vindicate the human race. Thank you.